Help us make March 21st, 2019, Nevada's biggest day of giving. Nevadans will unite for 24 hours of online giving to support their favorite organizations just like you during the 8th annual Nevada's Big Give. Join us and raise funds, gain supporters, and make a real impact all in one big day. Register your organization and find all the tools you need to make your organization successful during the Big Give at nvbiggive.org. So don't miss out on donations. If you register your organization before February 21st, you can participate in early giving. nvbiggive.org. Nonprofit governance. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. The Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits presents Nonprofit Everything, the podcast about everything nonprofit, with your host, Andy Shurick and Stacy Wedding. Hey, 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 everybody. It's Stacy Wedding, and I am here with my co-host. Andy Shurek. All right. So we're here today with uh, another episode of Nonprofit Everything. And uh, thanks to Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits and for uh, making this possible to all of you, all of our listeners. We encourage you to uh, submit a question, get in touch with us, um, share this out in your networks and uh, keep the love going. Okay, Andy. So here's the question. We need some help with the pretty involved project and my board thinks we need to do an RFP. Do I need to do this? Where do I start? Oh, RFPs. They're, they're never fun. <laughs> <laughs> and when your board tells you, you need to do one, you're like, um, you I roll guess, your eyes and right? put and a dagger say, to your heart. And then you say, I have to do it. Right. If your board is telling you to do something, you need to do it regardless of whether or not you think it's a good idea. A lot of times, um, so, so RFPs, for those of you that aren't super familiar with it, it's a request for a proposal. And sometimes they use other words to mean R and F and P, but generally it's a request for a proposal where, um, if you need some big expensive service and you want to sort of send that out to bid, but you want, it's not as easy as like, just get some prices. If it's more complicated than that, you might have to put together a document that sort of explains what it is that you're looking for. Um, the challenge with RFPs is that you need to spend an awful lot of time thinking about what it is that you're trying to achieve. So, so let me give, I'll give you an example. So, so <laughs> it's pretty vague right now. It's a thing. And you put things <laughs> on it, right? um, so um, as an example, like say, for example, you have a, um, you need a new nonprofit accounting system and you need it to also integrate with some web stuff and some mobile phone stuff because you're checking employees in and out remotely, and there's all these just sort of bells and whistles and tweaks that you think that you need in it. But you're not really sure how to actually put that together yourself. You don't know, like, it's not like you can go online and type in, this is what I want, and get that one thing. So you need somebody to help you sort of assemble it, in which case you might need a consultant that will help you, like, figure out what you need first. So that would be a good example of what an RFP is. And what you would then ask for is you would ask for someone, you would say, I'm looking for a proposal on getting us to this particular point. Um, and then it, leave it up to them to explain how they're actually going to get you there. So what are the steps it's going to take? How many meetings? How long? You know, and then they're going to give you a price on it at the end. So, so that's technically what an RFP is supposed to be. Um, Unfortunately, what we see a lot of times is sort of RFP because you've been demanded to do an RFP and you don't really need it. Like you want to pick one person, like there's one consulting gig and you know that this one person is going to be really awesome at it. And then somebody says, well, that's going to cost you more than $11,500 or whatever the right. cutoff is. Yeah. You have to do an RFP. And so what you end up doing is um, creating an RFP to hire the person that you want to hire and then having to get two other people come in and bid on that project, which is not cool and not fair. No, um, no. For those of us that respond to those things, we call that column fodder and you don't yeah. want to ever be column fodder. No. Um, some of us won't even respond to RFPs. So if you're doing an RFP, um, some companies won't even participate because they know that like this, it's just too much work and you're going to spend so much time putting together this really weird report. Um, and then a lot of times you're not going to get the job. So sometimes they kind of bite you too. Yeah. It's interesting. I had, I had that experience in the flip end, um, recently where somebody actually called me and they had the courtesy and I appreciated it. They called me and, and we're like, we're putting out this RFP, but we really have in mind this really huge national firm that we 
want to respond to they it. They told you that? Yeah, they pretty that much told nice. me that, which was really nice, right? Because <laughs> those of us on the consulting end um, really can't stand it when we aren't told that and then we and we think we have a chance. So anyways, I appreciated that. But yeah, it can sometimes feel a little bit like that feels like a waste. And that I always say to organizations, is there any way you can kind of challenge that? Like if we already know who we want, then why are we going through this process? Um, right. I mean, because it's kind of like, it's a waste of our time. It's a waste of the people who are responding their time. And that doesn't build good rapport and relationships. Um, I think though, what I like about RFPs, even though, even though they can be a big pain in the butt for the, for the organization having to put it together is I think it helps from a accountability, a good governance perspective, um, it kind of evens the playing field a little bit, right? And it helps avoid favoritism. I mean, if you have a board member that has their pet um, firm or their pet person they always go to, right. that helps eliminate it. And it's just good government. I mean, what's the rule of thumb? I think it's like for audits, you should go out to bid every five to seven years. Now, that may not require a full RFP process, but it might. Um, and so it's it's one of those things where I think it helps keep it fresh. It's also good to have your existing kind of vendor relationships know that it's not just a given all the time, right? They right. have to they have to kind of bring their A game. And for that reason, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. And and certain contracts, if you have state contracts or federal contracts, sometimes they require that if you're getting services over a particular dollar amount that they want to see some sort of bid process in place. Mm -hmm. And and that a lot of times could prov you need an RFP for that because you don't know exactly what you're asking for. And so you're going to need assistance putting that together. Um, another place that you frequently use it is if you're going – like somebody's going to give you a ton of money and all of a sudden you realize you need an investment policy. And so yeah. you want to get an investment manager and I can guarantee you that there's already one on your board, yeah, you know, absolutely. or somebody that's married to one on your board. Yeah. Right? So, so being able to, to have a, a serious, like, you know, we don't want to necessarily automatically pick somebody that's directly connected to the, the organization because that's, you know, that's a conflict of interest. Number one, it could be a problematic from that perspective, or it just, could be a bad idea. I mean, they might be really nice, but they might be terrible at investment management. So you right. want to you want to be able to collect information to be able to decide which one you want. And the RFP is a formal way to do that. And I think I can't remember the word you just used, but you said a word like it was like oh, the challenge with these things, right, is that there's a lot of work that goes into them. And so I guess I would say I agree with that. I also think, though, I'm going to be Pollyanna and say, OK, I also think there's an opportunity with that. Right. Because it really helps you clarify as an organization when you have to go through that process, right? You have to figure out what are our budget parameters? Is there a specific skill? What does success look like at the end? What exactly are our needs? Because it's very easy in an organization for people to be talking different, you know, sort of having different expectations about what they actually want, which then nobody's happy with the end result. This helps you really kind of you know, assemble that team of that little project team, if you have it, whether it's volunteers or board members or whatever, that is going to help really think through what is it specifically that we want at the end of this. And then articulating that, yeah. that can be, I think, an invaluable process. I think if, if that's the way that they worked, that would be amazing. <laughs> but you don't think that's... No, I think, I mean, <laughs> as someone who receives RFPs for things, um, yeah. a lot of times it's just somebody's copied it from someone else. So of what course. you do is you're like, I have to do an RFP. And then you like call around to your friends. <laughs> have you ever done an RFP for investment management services? Yeah, here's one. Or here's one I found on the internet. And then you tweak it a little bit. Yeah, and that's so, it, so true. So you're not going through that process at all. So, so yeah, as it, I mean, I agree 100%. If you want to use that as a planning tool to say, you know, seriously, let's, ser let's sit down and think about and spend a lot of time on the front end thinking about exactly what it is we want. And then designing the RFP around that, that would be amazing. The problem is then, I mean, just in the case of investment management services, if you ask them for goofy things, they're not going to respond. They're right. going to they're, they're <laughs> respond and they're just not going to answer your questions. So you're going to get a bunch of non-responsive RFPs yeah. and then you're going to end up picking the, you know, the best of the worst. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. I wish there were an easier answer. So when you think about the question, you know, the, one of the questions, part of this question, There's right, question. was was where do I start? Yeah. So, I mean, I think if we were really, at least for me, if I was giving you guidance on where to start, do it the right, like, if you're going to do this and you've got to do this, do it the right way, right? And get this small little group together of people that's kind of like, you know, you have a project leader on it, but that's going to help brainstorm what it is specifically you need. What are the parameters? What are the limitations? And then, you know, you can look at another RFP as a format, if you want, of how you want to articulate this. There's actually a great 
um, resource that we can link to on this. TechSoup actually has a great resource. And while it's a little more geared toward technical, it still applies kind of universally. Um, that's really related to here's the steps of what you need to do to go through you know, a sound RFP process. And it's got some really good pointers. Um, so anyways, we'll make sure we link to that too. Awesome. My board wants me to start tracking things through cost centers. What does that even mean as a nonprofit? <laughs> well, that's a great question, actually, because <laughs> it doesn't really mean anything for a nonprofit, right? So, okay, so cost centers, um, from, man, this is turning into a nonprofit accounting podcast, isn't oh, it? Oh, boy. Well, what are we doing wrong? Um, <laughs> stop asking us. Well, it's because you're such a you're such a brainiac Apparently around I'm this answering stuff. Them so and, yeah. everybody likes what they hear. Uh, okay, so. Um, so cost centers. So, so the, the concept of a cost center is that you want to be able to, in a, in a for-profit world, you want to be able to see if we're doing this thing, we're selling this product, um, we want to know what our profit margin on, is on that prof product so we can decide whether or not we want to keep doing that. Um, so you can break your business down into a whole bunch of little chunks and says, this one product gives us this profit margin, we spend this much money on it, we make this much money, but these other products are better, so we're going to get rid of the old ones and get the new ones. So when you try to apply that same concept, if you try to just drop that right on top of a nonprofit, that concept just completely breaks because at no point, I mean, you can, and I would, this would be a much more interesting question is, should you use some sort of cost analysis to determine what programs that you're in? Let's answer that one too later. Ooh. <laughs> um, so, so if you see where I'm going with this, if you used true cost analysis to determine what things you should be working on, what you would technically be saying is, what is the sexiest things to donors? What is the sexiest donor thing? I'm going to work on that project so I can get the most donor dollars in it. Um, from a sort of a nonprofit ethics perspective, that's probably not the direction that you want to go in, right? You want to, you want to be more interested in like determining what the need is, trying to address the need with your, whatever your nonprofit is doing, and then raising money because of that need and not because kids and puppies happen to be able to bring in the most money. So let's just focus on right. kids and puppies, right? right? That's a terrible way to run, right. just ethically terrible yeah. way to run your nonprofit. So, so. And yet a smart business way, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, mean I, I get the ethics and yet it's also like, okay, well, that's our most profitable or that's our most, you know, we are having the most benefit, most bang for our buck with that. So uh, I don't know. So is it really unethical? I mean, I don't know that it's unethical. I think it's dangerous. Yeah. I think it's dangerous because you then you tend to stray from your mission. Because if you're interested in this is totally not I love this not answering the question at all. <laughs> if you are um, if you're if you're chasing donor dollars, which is sort of universally understood Absolutely. as a bad idea, that right? That is bad. Yes, you're chasing donor dollars and then and then um, like systematizing and institutionalizing your development process because you're chasing donor dollars, because you recognize that, that donors are interested in particular things. It's easier to raise money for those particular activities. That's going to pull you further and further away from your mission. Absolutely. So, I mean, so we're, we're at a really high level here, right? This is, yeah. this is not, this is not technical detail where you're talking about particular cost centers. So that, that, I think that's where it gets dangerous. I get that. I think what I'm trying to figure out though, is what you were saying. Like if you, when you use the first example with for profit, which could really be transferred to nonprofit when you were like, what is most profitable for us? Right. I mean, I don't think that's bad logic to use when you're doing, when you're analyzing, okay, this is not sustainable. We are always losing money on this. Now, if it's important enough to our mission and we've made a conscious decision that that's still important, great then we'll do it. But we should try to probably minimize those or figure out how we can make them have a little bit more um, impact or have something that is delivering more if we're going to continue doing it. Uh, yeah, I agree. Right? I, mean, I, I, I think if, if you're doing something, so uh, it's hard without an example. So yeah. let's, let's just think of a, let's think of a, like, so you're, you're in the homeless space, say, um, and, and your, your mission of your organization is to make sure that the homeless population is taken care of. Okay. Um, then, then that's all of your programs should be focused on that particular Absolutely. activity. Right. Um, if, if you've noticed that donors are more interested in women than men, you have to decide as an organization, like, do you want to raise money specifically for women 
exclude and exclude men because it's easier to raise money that way. Yeah. No. Um, so you either you either modify your mission, right, to say we're actually going to focus on homeless women, or or you figure out ways to to get people to understand that you know maybe you want to tackle the bigger problem and not just one specific slice of it because it's easier to do. So so it's a I mean I don't think you're wrong. I don't I don't I don't disagree that you need to you need to do a business plan and figure out where that money's going right, to come from right. and you need to make sure that you've got enough you've got enough juice in your program idea that you can actually convince people to give you money for no reason other than they think it's a good idea. So so there's a definitely a balancing act there. But if we go if we go the way of just what's the easiest to raise money for, I don't know that we're going to solve any of the world's problems. I'm thinking it would be great. And if I, I will find the book and we can put it, we can link to it. There's a great book. And you may know what I'm talking about, Andy, that was it was like, can't remember if it was called like the sustainability model or a sustainability matrix. But it was a really great tool to say, OK, make conscious decisions right about what. What programs, what services are important enough that you are willing to take a loss on them, but don't make, when you are having every program like that, that's dangerous, right? right. So sustainability wise, how do you have the ones that are, you need a balance, right? You need a healthy mix, just like in an investment portfolio, you need a healthy mix of probably high performers and ones that maybe right now aren't performing well, but will down the road or right. whatever. So anyways, I'll, I'll make sure to to share that because I think it would be a great, they have some great tools in there. You can, as an organization, go through that analysis. And I think it ties into all this with cost centers and cost analysis and all that good stuff. But, yeah. yeah. Awesome. We'll put that in the, in the show notes. Okay. You can find that. Um, okay. So, but back to the question. Yes. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> We diverge. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> um, what the way you can use cost centers in, in your nonprofit though, is to, to be able to, collect information about how much it costs to run any particular program. Now you need to already do this for your audit and you need to do it for your financial statements because you have to divide all of your expenditures into your three buckets. Your what's a program expense, what's a fundraising expense and what's a management and general expense. So everything needs to be divided into those three chunks anyway, but you might want to know like how, if we've got multiple programs, if we're running multiple programs, how much money are we spending in each one of these different programs? And then you can sort of break it out into different pieces problem is, is that the, the revenue side of it completely breaks down. So unless you're raising, unless you're only raising restricted funds, which would be, you know, on a cr crazy train, yeah, <laughs> like would yeah. never be a Yikes. good idea, right? You can never, you want to get as much unrestricted funding as you can get. And then you want to sort of subdivide that into like, it needs to go where it needs to go. Right. Which is, I think, you know, kind of where it dovetails with the other part of your question. So mm -hmm. if, if puppies and kids are what brings in the money, Make sure that you're also getting unrestricted money so that you can spend it in other ways, right? Absolutely. So, so not to forget those kinds of things. Um, but as far as cost centers go, yeah, you're going to want to break your programs down so that you can, number one, so that you can report on it to your board to say, we're doing X, the outcome is Y, and it costs Z, right? Mm -hmm. you, we can be able to say that. And then it helps you budget too, because the next time you go through your budgeting process, you've got your budget divided into whatever those program areas are. And you can, you can specifically say, this is the money that we're raising to do this particular thing. You can tell donors things like the food banks do, where $1 equals three meals. The only way they can do that is by having a giant spreadsheet, which says, here are all the inputs to our food programs. Here are all the outputs of our food programs. And we know how this all works because we've got it divided to 113 different ways. And so we can specifically say, and if you, you know, if, I mean, do that. Go to the food bank and say, right. can you show me how you calculate that? Because they will love that. They'll be like, yes, please. I'd love <laughs> to show excited, you how. Yeah. Right? We've you? worked so much on this and no one ever asked, but they just trust us. Yeah. So, yeah. So getting those kinds of calculations, which are really attractive to donors, um, the only way you're going to get that is by really tracking cost centers properly. I am the board chair of a medium-sized nonprofit, and we are looking to hire a new executive director. We'd like to make the compensation more attractive by offering a bonus if they meet our revenue goals. Do you have any ideas on how we should structure this to make it an ambitious yet realistic goal? Sure. Yeah, definitely. But before we, I answer that question, I want to unpack the inside part of the question where you say you want to make compensation more attractive by offering a bonus if they meet our revenue goals. So um, the AFP Code of Ethics actually prohibits um, tying any kind of bonus or compensation specifically to fundraising. It's just tacky. So you don't want to, I mean, basically you don't want to hire people and then say, if you raise, you know, you get 
five percent of everything that you raise or something because that just that just feels wrong and the AFP code of ethics says you can't do it, so don't do that. And I have to jump in here for a minute because I completely, yes, I couldn't even get past that part of this question because of that. So yes. candidly, like, I'm glad you're trying to tackle the goal, the goal piece, because I was like, oh, yikes, run for the hills. But I figured for this podcast, I wanted to make sure we had the exact information and AFP Code of Ethics, anyone who's listening, if you're not familiar with it, go check it out. Um, Association of Fundraising Professionals, because candidly, it really is the best practice in how you know, you should run sort of your fundraising and development function. And it's got a lot of different pieces in there that I think are completely valuable. Um, but one of the piece in the code of ethics that's interesting that people and I, I was sort of reminded of this when I looked at it. So I want to just share it because um, the piece of the, you know, there's part of the code of ethics that just says, um, you know, Nonprofit executives are permitted to accept performance-based compensation, such as bonuses, only if such bonuses are in, in accord with prevailing practices within the members' own organizations and are not based on a percentage of contributions. So what that means, in essence, that I'm not sure, I think somewhere along the way, it's gotten clouded or grayed in different people's minds, thinking nothing to do with revenue can be tied to, like, I've heard organizations use this, and I think they've taken this one piece of the code of ethics and kind of exploded it. But Here's what would be acceptable. So, you know, if let's say um, you're a director of development or you're an executive director and there's a bonus plan to be 10% of your annual salary, right? Um, and it's based on you bringing in 10 new corporate sponsorships um, and, you know, uh, you know, 10 major gifts of $10,000 or more. That is absolutely acceptable. And so what's interesting is people are sort of, I think, clouding that code of ethics. And right. it's actually just more about like percentage, right, right, of compensation. So you're not going to take if you're a grant writer or whatever, you know, you're not going to like, oh, I brought in a hundred grand. So I get a percentage of that. That's right. what gets icky. But I just wanted to clarify it for our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you, you walk, it's like you walk into a furniture store, right? And yeah. you get attacked because you know, everybody there's on commission. Yes. And that's what oh. they're trying to avoid is that sort of like absolutely. being on commission thing. Ugh. right? Yeah. But yeah, so, it's so it's absolutely totally legitimate to have some sort of bonus structure set up for your executives and and having it connected to revenue is perfectly okay Absolutely. as long as it's not it's not a commission type situation right 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 and and but the probably what the better thing to do to think about it is to think about outcomes so the reason you're raising revenue in your nonprofit is not just because you like money right because yeah. then you wouldn't be doing you shouldn't be doing a nonprofit yeah <laughs> probably yeah. you're Absolutely. doing it wrong if that's the reason you're doing it um, th but the reason you're doing it is because you want to have some sort of outcome. And so it's, in most cases, tying a bonus to the actual outcome, which, because then, to be honest, that gives the executive more, more ways to reach the goal. Right. So if, like, revenue isn't the only way to getting more money isn't the way to do it, like, maybe being more efficient, maybe killing off programs that were a dumb Absolutely. idea to begin with was a good idea. Maybe, you know, there maybe maybe getting the staff to work in a different way or or coming up with creative ways to get the job done. There's lots and lots of ways that you can get to that ultimate goal that don't specifically have to do with raising more money. That said, there's nothing wrong with raising more money either. Right. right? So so having a, a revenue component to it, like like you said, like connected to some sort of activity is a good right. idea. Because that's like a means toward the end, right? And that's what I think people get tied up into, like trying to be too prescriptive. I see too many bonus plans that people are trying to be prescriptive. And it's almost like, here's what we want you to do. We want you to put out this many social media blasts or get this many volunteers. Oh. And it's sort of like, okay, but for what? Like, what are we ultimately trying to accomplish there, right? Yeah. And, and, it, and that certainly goes into a totally different question of like, what is the board's role? Oh, yeah. Like the board's yeah. role 99% of the time is not to tell you how many social media <laughs> hits or whatever you're supposed to get. That's, that's, that is the definition of in the weeds. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right. Makes my skin crawl. <laughs> right. Yes. So, so, um, but okay. So to, back to go to back to answer the question to how to come up with a a number that seems like, let me go look at the actual text again of the question. It said, I want to come up with something that was um, ambitious yet realistic. So, so this is sort of a common budgeting question that, that every company goes through, regardless of whether you're a for-profit or a non-profit, is to, to how do you forecast? Like, how do you right. determine what the right level of something is? And the answer is you do a lot of hard work <laughs> of figuring out 
like how exactly where that money's going to come from, exactly how that money's going to be spent. Um, I know in other questions we've answered recently, we've talked about cost centers, like trying to figure out exactly what your programs cost and where that money's going to go. And this is a, a big process that's going through. One of the tools that I like to use, um, when, especially when you're forecasting fundraising, is to actually go all the way, as you're doing it, go all the way down to the level of detail of exactly who are you going to ask for the money, how much are you going to ask for, and what is the likelihood that they're going to give you that amount of money? And then you can just sort of multiply all those things together. So if, Stacy, I think I'm going to get a 1000 bucks out of you, but right. there's like actually a 10% chance, I'm going to book you for 100 bucks. Absolutely, <laughs> right? Right. So, right. And as you, the, you know, the more information you get in that system, the more brains you have working on that problem, that more accurate your fundraising projections get. And then you can actually see, you can look at it and you can say, like, I would actually, you know, you said you can get to 25 people this year. I'd like to see you get to 30 people this year. And then let's actually write down who those 30 people are, exactly. what dollar amount you think you're going to be able to get from them, what the likelihood of receiving that gift is. And then that gives you the number. And that's that's 100% realistic. And it's a stretch goal because it's like, if you can get there, you know, if these close really early because you're hitting all those goals and and then you can get to those stretch goals, that's a really good way to do it. Um, there's no magic formula. You know, if you say, oh, add 10%, add 15%, add three bucks, add whatever, you're just making it up. Right. That's you so know? random, yeah, right? And, and yeah. you should you should be able to know. And the executive should be able to tell you, like, here's what I think we can do. And then here's what I think a stretch goal looks well, like. Well, and you just hit the nail on the head because that's what I felt like, like what, what this question, what I'd encourage the board chair who wrote this question to think about is how they can be a partner with their new executive director and guess what? Like on setting those goals and that executive director is going to need some time to get their feet wet and figure out what they're doing and all sorts of things. So it may not even happen immediately. Right. But after that executive director has been there for, you know, six months or something and three months and can start to actually really, you know, has met everybody is building the relationships and doing all that. Perhaps then it's a sit down of, okay, what does an ambitious goal look like? Right. And I also, I think this ties back to strategic plan. I mean, for the nonprofits listening that sit there and go, oh God, that sounds like so much work when Andy just said, which it is a lot of work, right? So if that is not, you know, what someone wants to do, then I also think there's ways, I mean, you should be doing that theoretically with your strategic plan as well, but there's some ways to also do this in a more, I don't know, manageable way of here's our strategic plan. Here's sort of our key success indicators after the first year. And maybe that gets wrapped into some of this goal and bonus structure, right? Cause that's yeah. for the organization as a whole. Yeah. And, th- and the other caveat is you're bringing on a new executive director, which means you just lost your previous executive yeah. director. And you need to make sure that you're not just transferring the baggage that that person oh, yeah. had onto the new person. Oh, so the yeah. fact that you're talking about revenue tells me that the cha- one of the challenges that you had with the previous executive director might have been revenue. And you're trying to sort of make sure that you've got that shored up. You know, we're right. gonna we're gonna take a hard line on revenue because that was a <laughs> challenge last time. And and to be honest, with your new executive director, maybe the stretch goal is like, don't quit. Exactly. <laughs> 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 don't don't end up in the loony bin and don't quit. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. So, so coming up with things that are appropriate for who this person is, like it's exactly what you just said, is probably just as important as trying to figure out like how do we come up with that stretch goal. And you, as a, you know, the other thing I just want to say to any board members listening um, is, I, I am so amazed at how many people come in to an organization, right? They're a new whatever whatever position, but they sit there and realize, you know how much maybe was broken before them. Now that sort of just happens, right? No one, nothing, nobody does things the same way, but also give some lenience to this new executive director has got to come in and kind of assess where things are at, what's working, what's not, what, you know, what has been effective, what hasn't. And I mean, I, that takes a little bit of time and they may also tell you, God, this is way worse than what you even thought board member. So, so be open to hearing that. Cause that's part of what happens when you have a fresh perspective. did it. Congratulations. You got to the end of another episode of Nonprofit Everything. So I'm going to guess that you're listening to this in your car. If you're listening to this in your car, um, don't do anything now. It's dangerous. But I want you to like put a little mental note in your brain that 
Um, you need to, and just remember, just repeat this to yourself like a mantra. You need to go to the nonprofit everything website or the and website or some other way. And you need to ask us a question. It doesn't have to be a question you have. It can be a question that you've heard. It can be a question that someone mentioned to you. It could be something you were laughing about the other day because, oh my God, could you believe that they said this? Um, (laughs) we want those questions. Um, we love answering these questions. And the only way that this works is if we get more questions. So, um, I've said questions 11 times now, which means it should be cemented in your brain. <laughs> the next time you're sitting in front of a, a computer or phone or other sort of internet connected device. Not while you're on the road, though. Um, by the way, you can also say, hey, Alexa, <laughs> play nonprofit everything and that will work. You could say, hey, Siri. You could say, hey, Google. If you say do that, try it. It's awesome. Um, scare your family. It's awesome. It's <laughs> awesome. 